Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Freight Waves Now. We're coming to you live from the Bitter Symposium here in Atlanta. We've got a little bit of a different format today. We want to do more of a, a sit-down discussion with JP Hempstead here in Atlanta and talk a little bit about what we're seeing in the freight markets. We wanted to talk about volume and capacity, look at some year-over-year -year uh, comparisons, and also have a look at what we're seeing with hours of service. Uh, the number of hours drivers are driving is increasing, MPG is increasing, and uh, we wanted to d then dive into some other markets. So JP, um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about some of the volume that we're seeing. Uh, generally, as we look at the market, outbound tender volumes are up about 1.1% year over year. Yeah, so, we're, we're seeing some, yeah. some green shoots out there, yeah. right? And some individual markets, volume is certainly increasing, like in Memphis today, uh, on the Daily Watch today, uh, we reported that volume was up in, in Lakeland, Florida. So there's definitely signs in southern Georgia, northern Florida, southern Florida now that volumes are starting to spike. Sounds like produce to me, produce right? Produce season is starting to come and we desperately need that from a carrier perspective. Uh, rates are sort of at, uh, you know, between 30 and 50% lower, uh, cents per mile lower than contract and spot this time last right. year. So rates are really low and capacity is loose. What, um, so capacity is loose. We've been hearing about that for a while. Um, you know, the historic run up in, you know, spot rates and driver wages over the past, you know, we'll call it two years. Um, what, can you break down what that capacity looseness looks like um, in terms of equipment type? Right. Yeah, if we, if the three types that we look at in sonar are flatbed, dry and reefer. Uh, you know, van has had the loosest capacity overall. The tender rejections in van are at 12 month lows down under the 5% range. And, and that means that carriers are accepting 95% of loads that are tendered. Uh, that tells you that they don't have a lot of optionality and they're accepting whatever loads are coming to them, which means spot rates are generally low. As we know, uh, uh, spot rate tracks our tender rejection volume really right. tightly. Uh, Flatbed has had a much better go of it. Their, their tender rejections are up in the 10 to 12% range. Uh, it's been more consistent, much less volatility in the tender rejections in the flatbed space. Uh, they've had a much better first quarter this year. Refrigerated carriers have actually had a pretty good year in comparison because they've, ha they've benefited from the cold weather and all of the protect from freeze requirements for freight. So with, with what uh, the cold weather brings, it actually helps refrigerated carriers, which is kind of counterintuitive that you would need a refrigerator trailer to keep freight warm. So a lot of that dry van freight we saw this year uh, actually in, uh, increased the demand for refrigerated trailers. Right. But this time last year, JP, uh, tender rejections were three to four times higher than they are today. So last year we had very high uh, spot rates versus contract rates. We had tight capacity coming into, into Q2 of 2018. This year we've got a very different market. So even though volumes are up 1% or thereabouts, we've got uh, incredibly loose capacity across the country, with the exception of a few markets where there is some tighter capacity, particularly in the Midwest refrigerated area. One other thing on the year-over-year -year volume numbers, 1.3% uh, up year-over-year, -year, which is good. Yeah. Um, but you said there might be some evidence that shipper that those volumes are actually higher, that we're not seeing some right. of those tender rejections right. or the, right. those tenders because shippers are putting freight directly into the spot market to save money. Is that yeah, anecdotally we hear from some of the shippers we talk to that because they got double digit freight increases this time last year, what they were looking to do this year was decrease their transportation costs. So as capacity loosened, the natural tendency is to tend to freight into the market to take advantage of spot rates. Right. So uh, our uh, discussions we've had with a lot of customers, that's exactly what they've been I've doing. I've heard that from uh, some brokers too, yeah. who've had awkward conversations yeah. when they see their contracted customers yeah. freight yeah. in the spot market right. at right. lower prices. Right. And you know, it's like, oh, well, we can cover this for you, but yeah. what about that thing we were talking about right. earlier, that, right. you know, that higher contract right. rate? And this is what transparency brings, right? Is, is we now we can see what's going on in the market. And, and of course, carriers are at the sort of the bottom of the, the uh, poll here and they're getting you know squeezed with um, you know lower freight rates um, but generally speaking capacity is as loose as we've seen it certainly since 2016-17. Um, uh, yeah on a definitely on a national basis but it seems like there are a number of markets across the sort of right. southwest and right. southeast that are, are decently tight that have tender rejection uh, rates above 10%. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking especially of El Paso right, and right, Fayetteville. Right. Can you talk a little bit about what's going on in El Paso? So El Paso is one of the major commercial zones. It's not as big as uh, the Laredo market where a lot of uh, produce comes through, but it's certainly a large commercial zone. Um, 
this time of the year, we normally see a lot of produce come through the, uh, that, that, those commercial zones in Texas. So normally we'd see a lot more onions and tomatoes this year. Um, ag again, anecdotal evidence from Mexico tells us that the supply of onions has been constrained because domestic demand is up. Uh, we've just seen a new tariff, in, in, new tariff increased on tomatoes. So that could slow down the supply of tomatoes into the US. So what we normally look for in the El Paso market is this time of the year is a lot more produce coming through than what we're seeing. But because of its location, you've got to be a specialist carrier to get into that market because it's so far south. So you've actually got to have fairly balanced lanes right. to get in there. And what's happening now is I suspect there's tender rejections today in, the, in that market are up around 20%. So what that tells me is there's, there's the more loads and the carriers haven't arrived there yet. Right, right. The carriers aren't getting, because it's like the, you know, fairly remote region of right. the country. Right. Um, right. As far as Laredo goes, we're not seeing the same kind of tightness. Um, I was talking to a freight broker who specializes in cross-border, right. both uh, U.S. Canada, right. but also U.S. Mexico. And he said that because of the, um, the Border Patrol and ICE's transfer of customs agents right. over to immigration right. duties, right. that you know, the cross-border traffic in Laredo has slowed to a trickle. It's, right. it's taking up to 24 hours for trucks to get across. Right. Now, I wonder if yeah. the carriers on the other side are just sitting around waiting for these loads to come through and that's why tinder rejections there are so low. Well, I, I think what's probably happening is that message has got uh, around the various truck stops and people are acutely aware of what the delay is, so they're let us inclined to go there. Right. So what's happening is tinder rejections are higher because there's less capacity. Um, you know, capacities like water, it'll, it'll follow the path of least resistance. So if you've got a lot of resistance on the border in terms of getting trailers across and excessive wait times with the, the trans-border companies, uh, you'll, you'll run somewhere else. You, you won't go to Laredo, you'll run to other parts of, Mex of uh, Texas to keep your assets moving. I see, and yeah. you're, we're still seeing a little bit of uh, disruption in the Midwest. Right. Is, that, is that due to the, the flooding in the Missouri River Valley? Yeah, that's a big part of it. Geographically, since the flooding uh, in February the, and the levee breaks we've just seen in the last week or so, it, it's, a, it's a problem for shippers in particular because a lot of the people that work in the areas that, that produce the products and do the distribution side of the equation, uh, they can't get to work. So there's disruption on that side of it. Then there's a physical limitation of getting trucks into that market, so carriers are less inclined. What we saw was a shift in refrigerator capacity as produce season started to ramp up, particularly in southern Georgia, northern Florida in the last two weeks, we've seen a shift in capacity into those markets. So that means that your traditional poultry belt all the way down the west side of the Mississippi and the east side to a degree, it's, it's hard to get into there because it's a lower population density area. So, you've, so carriers are reluctant to go there because of uh, higher wait times and more deadhead miles to get into that market, even though rates might be higher. So we've seen a natural shift to where there's less resistance and carriers of uh, and rates have gone up in southern Georgia and northern Florida on the produce side as volumes have started to increase. That makes sense. And we've, I mean, I've noticed that reefer in reefer capacity in the Midwest has been kind of tight all year. I mean, partially because of cold weather, partially because of floods, partially just because of the natural imbalance of, of the freight flows there. But um, if they're all going, uh, you know, to um, you know, sunnier places right, right, down right. south, and I, that just makes it even harder. JP, last year, uh, especially around Thanksgiving, that's a natural uh, inflection point in the market where tender rejections for refrigerated equipment spikes up into the high 70s. Where, so if carriers are in that market, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of good money to be made from a spot rate perspective. Of course, it's a night, nightmare for shippers trying to find capacity, so they tend to lead time blows. And it's a nightmare to... for brokers too, right. that, that, that right. do a lot of, right. I, I know at least two people that um, I was talking to at Transparency 19 who um, are sort of overweighted in the right. reefer market. Right. And right. it's, you know, the, I mean, once you've done it for a few years, you kind of know what's coming, but it's still, it's, I mean, I've, I've heard several times right. of, um, you know, losing a thousand dollars on a load. Right. Just, I mean, de depending on how important the customer relationship is to you, it, it can be, there can be markets and lanes for reefer equipment that, that where it's very hard to source. Right, right. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about JP about something we're seeing in the um, hours of service side of the equation. Oh, right. Yeah, it's a, you know, as you know, we've got the notice of proposed rulemaking coming out, I think, in a week or so. I think it's being formally announced. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's July, early July is when that starts. So 
Uh, I just want to touch on our um, uh, OHOS 11 uh, index. What we're seeing this year is it, it's quite interesting, and I think you made a comment earlier that's probably the most relevant, and that is that as the, the temperatures warm up, drivers are running more miles. What we're seeing in the long haul sector, um, the over the road sector in our hours of service data is they're up about 5% more um, uh, hours per day, which is really interesting. That translates into about another 30 minutes. So drivers have gone from a, you know, about seven hours, 18 minutes on average per day of their 11 up to you know, seven hours and 48 minutes thereabouts. So it's a good sign that drivers are driving more hours, which means they're driving more miles in the over the road sector. Um, and of course, the long haul sector is not the biggest percentage of the freight task. About 37% of all freight moves less than 100 miles. So the, the long haul sector is not a big percentage of the freight, mask, but it's a freight task, but it's an important uh, task because of the distances that's required to move certain commodities. Do um, owner operators like long haul moves because yeah. they can run more miles? Yeah, more, so the, the key is more miles in each hour. That's what they look for. It's not necessarily the, the max speed. They like to you know, consistently push out miles every hour and maximise their miles per tractor week because that translates into the most important metric, which is revenue per tractor week. Yeah, yeah. So as we're seeing some mileage increasing. Regional operators, it's pretty flat. Uh, local operators are always spending around four and a half to five hours a day driving. Of course, they're mostly paid hourly and bumping docks, so the, the HOS is not such a big deal for those guys. Um, do, do you think that um, the you know being able to actually keep your truck rolling? 5% longer on a long haul route. Do you, is that correlated to, I mean, I can think of a couple of maybe overlapping or interlocking factors that might play into that. Right. One is just, you know, a general improvement in road conditions right. as we right. get into spring, as it's warmer, like right. you said. Another one, I mean, if, if we're talking about produce season and we think of the way that produce uh, production areas mm -hmm. are kind of concentrated on the periphery of the country, mm -hmm. yet everyone eats produce. Right. I mean, to me, that seems like almost an inherently long haul kind of move. Right, right. It, it is. And we've seen a lot of our winter produce start to die down, in particular things like citrus from Morocco and grapes from Chile. So a lot of those break bulk reefers that we've been tracking into each coast um, have started to slow down their number of sailing. So as our, as our temperature warms up here in the south in particular, our produce season starts to move from south to north. But what we've got is warmer, contra, uh, warmer climates on either coast where the temperatures are sort of consistently warm, which produces a lot of freight. And of course, most of our population is, is east of the Mississippi, which means by default, the California produce market and Pacific Northwest, where we've got apples and pears, it's got to move a long yeah, distance. over the road, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just the very last uh, metric that you pull yeah. up here, you know, kind of makes sense if you think about uh, an over the road driver, uh, long haul move, if they're if they're driving more minutes per day, it makes sense that miles per gallon is going up because yeah. the truck is going to be fuel efficient yeah. in the end. In more of a sweet spot, you know. So when you as traffic traffic speeds improve, road speeds improve, um, you start to run the truck more at the optimal torque range, the right horsepower band, the right RPM. Uh, the miles are easy because you've got less resistance on the road. But the big difference is the fuel blend. So we go from a, a winter to a summer fuel blend. Oh, interesting. And, and, it's, and it's fascinating because it's about a 5% increase in MPG. So the reason that the refineries are kind of at liberty to put all the different additives in the fuel to decrease the gelling of the diesel and stop the freezing of filters and things like that. Um, but of course, that lowers the energy content of the diesel in winter. So as you so get you, into the, so it's yeah. fewer miles per gallon. So as you get into summer, you've got a higher energy content, and the trucks run much better. Um, so you know, and that's that's an important thing as MPG increases. Yeah, you can really see it grow. Yeah. But, you know, if you, I mean, if you put a moving average on there, it might be even more clear. But right. all the way through yeah. uh, year to date, it seems like it's increasing. Um, yeah. Well, I think we, that's. Yeah. Yeah, and this is, this is a really interesting index from Venomics. We track this sort of seasonally year over year. Uh, we can break this down into each of the uh, 135 freight markets and you see a, a big difference based on coastal um, temperatures. You can actually track this and see the, uh, the delta on uh, temperature as you move across the country. Yeah. I think temperatures, I think average length of haul, just you know, congestion, yeah. all of that. Well, the big caveat though is, is on my way down here, I passed a lot of trucks with Jersey barriers. A lot of flatbeds hauling Jersey barriers, and that means only one thing, construction. Oh, oh dear. Oh, so, Jersey, the, the, those like orange and white big, barrels. The big concrete barrels. Oh, they, those, yeah, okay, so okay, okay. It's, it, this, is, this is a trucker's worst nightmare where they, where they yeah. turn two lanes into one on oh, the I-40. Yeah. And suddenly you've got your average miles falls, your MPG falls. So you know, some of this is really interesting to track over time, as, as now we've got more data coming into Sonar. 
But generally speaking, we are looking for a really strong uh, you know, Q2, Q3, so we can get some more volume for carriers. Shippers should be shipping more volume out. Uh, so we're looking for a, an, an interesting uh, summer as, as we move forward. Thanks, Dean. All right, so thanks, JP. I really appreciate the time. Uh, that, that's it, bringing you um, Freight Waves Now live from the Bitter Symposium here in Atlanta. And as always, um, follow us on YouTube, subscribe to our channel, and we'll see you again tomorrow.